Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on implications of annexation on the U.S.-Israel relationship. We are fortunate this afternoon to have two national experts with us, Ambassador Dennis Ross and Dr. Sarah Yael Hershon. My name is Ron Halbert, and I am the Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. The JCRC serves as the public affairs and community relations arm in the, in the nation's capital and surrounding region. With over 300,000 Jewish residents, our community is the third largest Jewish community in the United States. The JCRC represents the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington and more than 100 Jewish organizations and synagogues throughout the region. We are engaged in legislative advocacy and government affairs, Israel advocacy and education, intergroup relations and social justice, Holocaust remembrance and education, outreach in the schools, security, fighting anti-Semitism, and so much more. Most recently, during the pandemic, the JCRC has been engaged in securing vital government dollars to assist our agency during this time in need. At the same time, as our country has experienced an upheaval due to systemic racism, JCRC has been working in collaboration with our interfaith and intergroup partners to address these challenges. A key component of our work is empowering, training, and mobilizing our community to engage with and advocate for Israel. The JCRC is a strong supporter of the State of Israel, and we work hard every day to advocate for a robust U.S.-Israel relationship and a strong, safe, and democratic State of Israel. We are proud to convene wide-ranging conversations with experts, uh, uh, experts on issues of concern to the American Jewish community and the U.S.-Israel relationship. To lay the foundation of our conversation, I'd like to give a very quick snapshot of where things stand on the ground in Israel today. After three elections during the past year, Israel finally swore in a unity government under the leadership of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who will retain the premiership for the first 18 months before handing over the position to Kachol Levan leader Benny Gantz. This unity government came about as a result of lengthy discussions during a worldwide pandemic. The only policy issue that was codified in the coalition agreement is the authorization for the government to begin formal deliberations on annexation as soon as July 1st, and that is where we stand today. First, a little housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. Everyone participating in the call is muted, and the chat button is not available. We encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A button. We will try to respond to as many as possible after Ambassador Ross and Dr. Hershon each speak for 10 to 15 minutes. Now, let me please introduce our speakers. Ambassador Ross, who will begin the discussion, is counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a frequent appear, uh, and frequently appears at JCRC events. Prior to returning to the, to the Institute in 2011, he served two years as Special Assistant to President Obama and National Security Director for the Central Region and a year as Special Advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. He has served in many capacities to both Republican and Democratic administrations, and he has authored many op-eds in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other publications. He is the author of several influential books on the peace process, the Middle East, and international relations, including the most recent book, co-written with his Washington Institute colleague, David Makovsky, Be Strong and of, and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leader Shaped Its Destiny, and he was awarded the 2015 Jew National Jewish Book Award for history for, uh, for history for doomed to succeed the U.S. Israel relationship from Truman to Obama, which I personally read, it is, it is a fantastic piece of work. Um, I also like now I'd like to introduce Dr. Yael Hershon, and then we'll go right into our discussion. Dr. Yael Sarah Yael Hershon is currently the visiting assistant professor in Israel studies at the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern University. Her expertise focuses on diaspora Israel relations the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the Israeli ultra-national settlist movement. Her first book, City on a Hilltop, American Jews and the Israeli Settler Move Movement, published by Harvard in 2017, hailed as a landmark contribution to the field and was the winner of the 2018 Sam Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature Choice Award. She is currently working on a new book manuscript tentatively entitled New Day in Babylon and Jerusalem. Zionism, Jewish Power, and Identity Politics since 1967 on American Zionism since the Six-Day War. 
Prior to her appointment at Northwestern, Dr. Hirshhorn was the university research lecturer and Sidney Bricktoe Fellow in Israel Studies at the University of Oxford from 2013 to 2018, and a postdoctoral fellow in Israel Studies at Brandeis University. She's a graduate of Yale, where she received her BA. She got her MA and PhD at the University of Chicago and is a recipient of numerous grants and fellowships. And apart from her academic work, Dr. Hirshhorn is also a prominent, uh, prominent voice, bringing scholarship into the public square as a frequent public speaker, writer, media commentator, and foreign policy consultant on Israel and Jewish affairs. Now, with those introductions, Ambassador Ross, if you would please uh, uh, lead us in about 15 minute uh, oversight. And thank you both for joining us this afternoon. You need to turn your audio on. Okay, now so I hear me. you want to hear me as well. That's good. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ron, always nice to see you. So nice to meet you virtually. Uh, you know, I'm, I, you're, I am a frequent uh, visitor to, uh, to the JCRC, as you mentioned, so I'm looking forward to the time when we do not have to do this virtually. I suspect we all are. So let me, let me kind of frame what I think the, the issues are uh, in the whole annexation issue and the question of debate discussion surrounding it. I guess the first point to make is the following. Uh, the Trump administration obviously came out with a peace plan. In that peace plan, 30% of the West Bank was allotted to Israel. The Palestinians were given four years, a window of four years to engage in negotiations. Uh, and what you have on the Israeli side, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, even before the last election, actually there were three elections before we produced, the, we, we have seen the emergence of this particular government. Uh, and, and each time you had Prime Minister Netanyahu promising that he would annex the territories. After the Trump plan and having 30% of the, of the territory allotted to Israel, he has declared his intent to go ahead and, and annex. But it's not so simple because, Ron, as you alluded to, there's a reality. The, you now have a national unity government. Uh, and one signal that has now come from the administration that has become increasingly strong uh, is that this administration, certainly Jared Kushner, would like to see the Israeli government come to an agreement, meaning the full part of the Israeli government, both sides of the Israeli government, the prime minister and the alternate prime minister, meaning Benny Gantz, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Gabi Ashkenazi with Bibi Netanyahu, they want a consensus. For several days last week, you actually had the American ambassador to Israel, uh, David Friedman, trying to mediate between the two. That ended yesterday. Uh, and the message from the administration is, once you've reached an agreement, come back to us. Now, the reality is, I think it's fair to say that Friedman has been an advocate for going ahead with annexation even now. I think Kushner's view is actually somewhat different. He views annexation as a lever to apply pressure on the Palestinians to engage on the basis of the plan, something they have refused to do. So we're at a point where, and you, met, you mentioned this, Rob, as of J July 1, Bibi's in a position to raise the annexation issue. At this point, there's no agreement between uh, Bibi and Gantz and Ashkenazi. Uh, Bibi, according to public reports today, has now presented four different scenarios of annexation, meaning the maximum 30% that's permitted in the Trump plan, going down to uh, what might be a, a very tiny percentage, a very small percentage. Uh, Gantz and Ashkenazi have made it clear they favor the Trump plan, but they don't favor unilateral annexation. They want to be sure that somehow the annexation can not be the end of diplomacy, but can contribute to diplomacy. They are clearly getting messages from a lot of different sources right now. You had the Germ German foreign minister visit Israel. You had the unusual occurrence last week, last Friday, of the uh, United Arab Emirates ambassador to the United States writing an article in the Hedio de Haranot in which he spelled out all the convergence of interests that the Emirates and the Israelis have in the region, but that normalization can't proceed if there's annexation. Uh, and today I just might mention that the Saudi Arabia uh, issued a statement in the name of the king after holding a, what is their government meeting uh, which was a very tough statement against annexation. This was echoed in a tweet by the, uh, by the real leader of the United Arab 
Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, making clear that uh, this is, if the Israelis go ahead and annex, it's an illegal action. So you're getting a kind of blowback, and that I think is also affecting uh, where blue white is. Why, <clears throat> I might pose the question, why is it that Bibi seems so determined to go ahead with annexation? Uh, some people may have a political explanation. I actually have a very different explanation. And I want to tell a story to sort of help explain it. When I was negotiating what was the, then the Hebron protocol with Netanyahu during his first term as prime minister, we were together late one night. It was around midnight, just the two of us in his office. And suddenly he says, I'm going to do what Ben Gurion did. And I, of course, knowing that he emerged from the revisionist movement, meaning followers of Jabotinsky, I immediately, almost reflexively said, well, you mean Begin? And he goes, no, 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 no. What, what Begin did, that wasn't the big stuff. What Ben Gurion did, Ben Gurion did the big stuff. That's what I'm going to do. Bibi sees the current moment as his Ben Gurion moment. I might just say, Ben Gurion, when he declared the state, this was, an, this was an extraordinary decision he took. Uh, and in that decision, he understood that the price was going to be very high. He knew that Israel, that the, the new state of Israel was going to be invaded uh, by all of its Arab neighbors. They'd already endured six months of conflict with the Arabs of Palestine. Now they're going to be invaded by all the state neighbors. But he also knew his mission was to end 2,000 years of Jewish homelessness. And for him, if he didn't take advantage of the end of the British mandate and the British departure, you were probably going to see a UN trusteeship unless they filled the vacuum, they declared a state, they created a fact. So for him, it was a unique moment. Bibi sees this as a unique moment also because he believes with the Trump plan, he can create a whole new baseline for how the international community and any diplomacy relates to this issue. The, the kind of what he has seen as the kind of point of departure has been June 4, 67 lines. With the Trump plan, he thinks he can create a different baseline where 70% or 70% of the West Bank, that's the point of departure, not 100% of the West Bank. Uh, and he sees in this uh, an extraordinary opportunity to, in a sense, ensure that areas that he considers critical to Israeli security as well as important to Israeli settlement will always be part of Israel as a result. Now, where, where he separates from Ben-Gurion is that Ben-Gurion understood that there was a high price. Bibi doesn't believe there's a high price for this. He looks at all of the expectations in advance of the declaration uh, on Jerusalem. You know, the warnings that if you oh, if, if the U.S., if the Trump administration moves the embassy or declares uh, that Jerusalem is the United Capital of Israel, there'll be a violent response and nothing happened. Similar warnings about uh, the recognition of Israeli sovereignty in the Golan Heights by the, by the Trump administration. Similar Cassandra kinds of warnings in the event of the finally unveiling the Trump plan and nothing materialized. So he thinks the, there'll be some harsh rhetorical reactions, but nothing really practical. He thinks when the Palestinians warn that the PA may collapse and and Abu Mazen says he'll turn the keys over to Israel, and therefore they have to assume responsibility for the 2.5 to 2.6 million Palestinians in the West Bank. He, says, he sees that as a bluff. You know, what else do they have? They're going to give up what they have in terms of the PA? Will the Palestinian security forces really stop uh, cooperation? Because cooperation with Israel also helps to protect everybody, including the Palestinians, against Hamas. So he doesn't buy that trick. He looks at Jordan. He says when the, when the king of Jordan says, uh, annexation will trigger a massive conflict. Uh, he, did, he dismisses it, not as words, but, but as not being more than words. Because he says, look, Jordan has profound economic needs, even more so now, because of COVID-19. And it gets $1.5 billion a year from the Trump administration, an administration whose leader is not exactly an enthusiast for foreign assistance. Is he really going to put that at risk? He gets water, significant water help from Israel. He gets natural gas from Israel. Are you really going to put that at risk? Okay, maybe he's going to withdraw his ambassador, but he's not going to abrogate the peace treaty. The Arab states that are doing uh, a lot with Israel under the table aren't doing it as a favor to Israel. They're doing it because they see common threats. 
so you know maybe they'll complain about it, but it won't materialize. And and the, the potential problems in the United States, his attitude is, let's say that Biden gets elected. Biden is someone who's an instinctive friend of Israel. You know, okay, he's expressed his opposition to this, but he'll, you know, this will be done well before he becomes president, if he becomes president, uh, and I'll be able to manage things. So he's convinced himself that the risks are, are low and that the, that the gains are very high. I would like to suggest that uh, his assessment may well be wrong. Uh, first, the gains. If, in fact, Biden becomes president, and that certainly is not a, something that should be dismissed at this point if you're an Israeli, if he becomes president, uh, he's declared opposition to this. He's declared opposition to all unilateral moves, whether it's by the Israelis or by the Palestinians. A very high likelihood that he will, uh, will repudiate the Trump plan and he will not recognize the Israeli annexation. No one else in the world, at least no one of any significance is going to recognize the Israeli annexation. And we know from uh, a number of European states that if there's annexation, they will go ahead and they will recognize Palestine as a state in the 67 borders. Rather than creating a new baseline, you'll actually be cementing the old baseline. Uh, so there is a risk as it relates to that. There is a risk as it relates to affecting, I would say, the legitimacy of the Israeli position in the West Bank. Yes, the many question the Israeli settlement policy, but so long as Israel's position has been, we're here and we're here, but we're going, but we're prepared to negotiate over the future of this. So long as Israel wasn't preempting that or looking like they were preempting that, their position in the West Bank was legitimate. Uh, the minute they they look like they're preempting it, their position is going to look a lot less legitimate. That will resonate back here. We already see the left wing of the Democratic Party, the narrative they're developing about Israel, that will become much worse. The delegitimization move internationally will gain great strength from this, in part because one of the things that Israel will be doing, Israel will be violating one of the central premises of the Oslo Accords. One of the central premises was neither side would change the status of the territory, meaning the political status of the territory. Israel wouldn't declare sovereignty, the Palestinians wouldn't declare a state. Now Israel is going ahead and if they go ahead and they annex, even if it's uh, a limited amount, we can get into the, the different scenarios of what, uh, of what annexation might be. And maybe in the q and I can talk about what might be done to minimize some of the costs if it's only a, a limited annexation. When I say minimize, I don't mean remove entirely. Uh, but you have the whole question of giving delegitimization a boost. The, on the Palestinians, it is true that Abu Mazen has frequently threatened to turn the keys over. The problem is, at one of these points, the threat might become real. He might be the boy who cries wolf, but sooner or later, he might do it. And by the way, this might unleash forces uh, that he can't control. And we don't know whether the Palestinian Authority, which is going to, ex which is experiencing now, increasing economic difficulties, again, because of COVID. We don't know exactly what, what will happen with the PA. Um, the truth is, Bibi is very likely to hear from Shin Bet that they have very significant cons concerns about what may happen. It could be well be chaos. Hamas may decide not to remain quiescent. Even if they decide not to, not to heat things up from Gaza, they will certainly do more in the West Bank to try to promote terror. So there are uncertainties there. Uh, there are uncertainties, not so much that Jordan is going to abrogate the, the peace treaty, but let's say they suspend the peace treaty. That's a terrible precedent to establish, number one. Number two, then they need a justification. What justification will they have to, uh, to resume it? Uh, the, the Arab states, basically, uh, you know, the fact that they are they're issuing warnings out, maybe it's true, it'll only retain rhetorical, but what it ensures is a lot of stuff that's going on the table, the prospect of putting on top of the table diminishes pretty dramatically. Uh, and I think we, again, if you want to see things change for the better in the region, this is probably not the way to make it happen. I didn't say earlier that the, I didn't talk about what other than what the Europeans might do with regard, at least some might do with regard to recognizing a Palestinian state on 67 lines. I don't believe there'll be sanctions because you need a complete consensus for that. 
but you also need a complete consensus to maintain certain, certain programs. The Europeans have had something they call, what is now called Horizon 2020. In the last few years, they provided 1 billion euros uh, to the Israeli R&D sector. Uh, and there will be those who will say, let's end this now. And just as you need consensus to have sanctions, you also need consensus to maintain that program. This is a time where you want to see uh, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of euros uh, no longer available to Israel in the R&D section when Israel has uh, a million people unemployed, uh, when a high tech is what has been driving the economy. Uh, again, these are risks I think that are unnecessary because in the end, if I'm right, you have a reality where Israel controls the territories anyway without running any of these risks. Uh, I, I wrote a piece where I ended by saying, if I'm wrong about the assessment, Israel still controls the territory and doesn't pay a price. If Bibi's wrong about the assessment, he, his gains are illusory uh, and the risks are very high. Uh, and in a sense, I guess I would wrap up by saying, why roll the dice this way? Why invite uh, an effort, why invite an outcome that actually weakens your position internationally in terms of justifying why you are where you are, that runs the risk of shifting the attention away from what has been the main preoccupation with Iran and shifting it on to Israel on this issue. So uh, my bottom line is I can understand what is the source of attraction to him, but I think the context is not one that uh, is going to produce the outcome that he would like to see. I think the risks um, are real. And even if they don't all materialize, it's not a risk we're taking at this point. Ambassador, uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for your remarks. Now on to Dr. Seria El Hershon for her comments. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, Ambassador Ross is a very, very tough act to follow, and I can think of no better exponent um, of uh, some of these views on annexation. So I hope uh, all of you listening today will heed many of his warnings here. Um, I think I'll restrict my comments to speaking more about what I see as some of the trends of annexation um, in the way that it will affect diaspora Jewry. Um, particularly a younger generation of millennials um, who I interact with um, in the college campus space and, and elsewhere where the annexation issue has become extremely important. Um, as someone who spends a lot of time on social media, um, probably too much time, um, I see a huge amount of virtue signaling going on um, regarding the annexation issue, but actually very, very little substantive discussion of what um, either a pro-annexation or anti-annexation position really looks like. Um, I'm very concerned particularly about um, liberal American Jewry's attitudes towards anti-annexation. It seems to be a slogan, um, a virtue signal, um, a marker of one's identity, but I think that there's a very shallow understanding of what this position really encompasses. To my mind, um, you know, I, I think we need to be realistic about what the alternatives truly are today and maybe in fact for a generation because it could be that long between before Israelis and Palestinians are really prepared to come to a negotiating table again. Um, so the options today are not what I think I see on social media, which is a either a skipping to the White House lawn, um, you know, Rose Garden, Kumbaya in the Middle East peace treaty or uh, annexation. The options today are the status quo, which we know is in fact not all that static, and in fact looks something um, like a kind of creeping annexation or actual annexation. So we're looking at either the status quo or change. Now we can argue a lot about whether this change is for the good or for the bad, but these are the realistic options. There is no scenario where this is, you know, you're opposing annexation leaves immediately, do not pass go, do not collect $200 to um, a, final status agreement. So I think we need to be clear about what the parameters of being against annexation are really about um, and what the realistic alternatives will be for a you know, pretty long foreseeable future. At most what we're happening here is we're putting the borders issues of a final status agreement under a kind of bell jar, hoping that that seals that question for the time being knowing again that the status quo is not static and also that there are very other, various other final status issues which are changing all the time. So um, Eliminating one does not mean that you are actually um, 
putting the Israel-Palestine conflict in uh, the freezer, as Moshe Dayan once said. Um, these, these, are, these are issues that are um, completely dynamic. Um, and that this is at best preserving one of these maybe five core issues for the future. Um, the second thing I would, I would uh, uh, focus upon is the reasons for opposing annexation. There's a very, very good argument to be made for opposing the unilateralism of annexation because as Ambassador Ross um, has spoken about here and certainly um, can speak much more fully about it as experienced in the Oslo Accords, the core principle of Israeli-Palestinian um, Israeli peacemaking is a bilateralism, a sitting together at a negotiating table and coming to an agreement. Of course, a unilateral annexation by Israel abrogates that core principle of the two-state solution um, and is um, a matter of deep concern, I think, for American Jewry, but also for the international community more broadly. But it's another question to um, uh, think about what uh, is actually happening here. And again, as Ambassador Ross has um, underscored for us, there are various scenarios that are being debated by the Israeli government. We do, don't know yet what the scope of this annexation might be. But um, I think it requires some degree of magical thinking for those who uh, amongst liberal Jewry who are anti-annexation to think that there isn't going to be some kind of A word. Now we can call that annexation, we can call that territorial absorption, but there are upwards of 400,000 Jewish Israelis that live over the Green Line today, perhaps as many as 450,000, 550,000 to 600,000 who live over the Green Line, if you include the municipalities uh, over the Green Line that have been formally annexed to the uh, to the city of Jerusalem after the 1967 war. So I'm sure Sebastian Ross can tell you about his in-depth negotiations during the Oslo Accords. There was going to be a, a, a territorial absorption of many, though not most of these settlements. Um, and this is what was coming down the pipe. So those who are anti-annexation who think that um, this isn't going to happen, that requires some degree of magical thinking about what you think the future of um, these many Jewish Israelis who live suburban, normal lives over the Green Line is going to be in the future. And if you think that all of them are going to be leaving their homes, that either requires some degree of magical thinking about what the future solution is going to be, or perhaps something a bit more insidious, which I think is that some of those who are annexing, who are opposing annexation, are in fact trying to move the goalpost on the two-state solution entirely. That some of this virtual signaling is not really about the annexation issue itself. It's about, um, uh, about the two-state solution as a whole, and this may really indicate that um, there are many of those who are in that camp who are looking more towards a one state solution for the future. So I have concerns about um, the way liberal Jewry is thinking about this and just to have a much more realistic approach about what anti-annexation means. Um, I think many of us in this room support that point of view, but I think we should know why and what the implications of that will be. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, of course, we have a huge nominal nominational split around Israel and particularly about questions regarding the status of the occupied territories. Um, the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox have very different positions on these issues. Um, for the modern Orthodox, um, these are many of their friends, relatives, um, former synagogue members, youth group club um, uh, initiates who, who are now living over the Green Line. Today, there's over 60,000 American Jews who live um, in the West Bank, something I wrote about in my book. Um, and for them, this is a much more personal issue and they feel a much, much deeper connection to these territories, whether for their religious significance or because of associational reasons. Um, and their attitudes will become increasingly significant. I am curious to see what the implications of some of these new debates um, over racial equality will have on the Palestinian question as those have become, um, I think, much more salient within um, the modern Orthodox community only in recent weeks. And I'm wondering if this may begin to shift some attitudes when it comes to this question, but I think it is too soon to tell. The other issue I think is very important to watch is the uh, attitudes of the ultra-Orthodox community towards the annexation issue. Within Israel, there was a recent Israel Democracy Institute poll that revealed that in fact, the ultra-Orthodox constituency or the ultra-Orthodox votership in Israel are the most supportive constituency of all for some kind of annexation, whether that is with the U.S. approval or without, even outpacing the Likud voters in their support. So it'd be interesting to find out more about where the ultra-Orthodox community in the United States is on these issues. I don't think there's been any polling done, or at least to my knowledge, um, about their views on this issue, particularly because in a generation or two, ultra-Orthodox Jewry will in fact be the face of American Jewry, um, demographically and otherwise, perhaps even in their some of their political powers. So we really need to know where this group stands on some of these issues because it will determine a lot about 
U.S.'s relationship um, for the future. So I think I'll leave my remarks there um, and look forward to our continuing discussion. Thank you, Dr. Hirschhorn. Um, you both take yourself off mute, and um, I'd like to ask start by asking you each question, first to Dr. Hirschhorn, then to Ambassador Ross, and then we're going to open up the queue. We've got uh, 24 questions that have arrived so far, and since you have a hard stop at four, I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but I'm going to try to wrap them up thematically. Um, Dr. Hershaw, can you discuss some of the emergence, emerging differences among the settler movement itself in reaction to the Trump plan and annexation? Yes, for those of you who have been following the news very carefully, it's very interesting to see the schisms that are developing within the Israeli settler movement itself when it comes to the annexation issue. Um, uh, the Yesha Council, which is the umbrella organization representing the 150 plus settlements, um, legal and illegal, that uh, exist today, um, has come out very strongly opposed to the Trump plan and has, in fact, suggested that they may not be willing to, um, you know, participate with Benjamin Netanyahu in pushing this forward. There's some, been some very dramatic meetings between the two sides that have uh, ended in insults and ad hominem attacks one against the other. Um, so there's been quite, it's been quite a soap opera watching the Israeli settler movement or the official Israeli settler movement's uh, position on this. But I think, uh, but how, but the Yesha Council only represents one voice in this debate. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of the mayors um, and regional councils within uh, the settler, the settler uh, movement speaking out very positively about settlements um, and, and about, uh, excuse me, about annexation and about the Trump plan. Um, we can see someone like Oded Ravivi, who's the mayor of Efrat in the Gush Etzion region of the West Bank, which is that uh, the region closest to Jerusalem, the mayor of Ariel, a largely secular settlement um, in the Shomron region of the West Bank, one of, um, you know, one of the very hotly debated um, settlement blocks would include would have included REL. So I think for them, this is a, a moment to feel that finally their dream of being coming part of the Israeli consensus has come. Or other mayors like those of Male Adumim, um, which is a, a city outside of Jerusalem. Personally, I think that if there's going to be a very, very limited annexation, and Male Adumim might be the most likely small and symbolic option. Um, so there's a, a very big difference between what's going on amongst the official Israeli settler movement, which represents I would say um, those who subscribe to a kind of religio nationalist point of view on the Israeli settler movement, and those who largely represent the suburban quality of life majority, um, who are looking to have um, the, their status uh, formalized, although I would say that um, they, they too are relatively happy with um, how their lives look even without an annexation. There was an article in the Times of Israel yesterday interviewing a number of settler leaders um, and constituents, essentially saying that, you know, the kind of de facto annexation that is going on in Israel is good enough for them. And they don't really need de jure recognition by the United States or, or otherwise, because their lives are good. And exactly as Ambassador Ross said, why take the risk? There's no reason to really be pushing this forward. Um, so I think we're seeing a real schism here. And one of the important trends to watch is that although the Israeli settler movement in our media and scholarly viewpoint often looks like this group of uh, religious nationalists on a hilltop of the West Bank, you know, maybe in our minds very radical, the, the actual much larger constituency of the Israeli settler movement today are, um, are uh, secular or moderately religious suburbanites who are really looking for quality of life alternatives outside of the very expensive cities of Israel. Today, over 30% of settlers are Haredi who are looking for cheaper housing outside of B'nai Brak or Jerusalem. Um, I would say another 40 odd percent are secular, either secular or modern, uh, modern Orthodox settlers who also may have some ideological and security commitments to the Israeli settler movement, but um, in general are also looking for a suburban bourgeois lifestyle. And perhaps only 20 or 30 percent um, really represent that um, hardcore um, hardcore ideological core. So um, the diversity of the Israeli settler movement is coming to the fore. And therefore, I think we are seeing some very, um, very obvious splits between those who are very interested in maintaining their quality of life and those who have really um, very deeply engaged ideological commitments to annexation um, and the future of the movement overall. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, can you please discuss 
the different options of annexation uh, that are available and, and to answer the question, and I'm posing you the question that you suggested we posed to you prior, which is that what can we do and minimize the cost should it take place? Well, look, I mean, as I said, we don't know exactly what the four options are that BBS presented uh, to Gans and Ashkenazi. We do know at this point that the IDF has been given no maps. Uh, if you're gonna do this at a minimum, you have to be in a position where you can prepare it. So the talk that this is gonna happen July 1, is quite premature. But so let me, I, 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 the, if Bibi could do all 30%, you know, which I think is least likely right now, he himself is putting out the word, or people around him are putting out the word that it'll come in phases. Uh, what they're putting out is that he'll do all the settlements. Now there are 130 settlements. 52 are within what I call the blocks. And this really gets it that what, what Sarah was basically saying, you know, you have about 77%, or if you count, if you count the area across the green line, it's about 85% who live in about 7% of the West Bank closest to the green line. And those could roughly be described as blocks. There's another 78 that are outside those blocks. Uh, and one version would be, okay, you don't do the Jordan Valley because that might create real problems with Jordan, mostly because it creates enormous pressure on King Abdullah. His base, the East Bankers, fear that annexation is really an Israeli effort to drive the Palestinians into Jordan, changing the demographic makeup, changing the character of the state, and so forth. And he is in a position where he doesn't have a choice. He has to look like he's not simply acquiescing in this. So it's possible Bibi could say, I'm not gonna do the Jordan Valley because that'll take, that'll, that, it'll still be a problem for, for King Abdullah, but not nearly the problem it is if it's the Jordan Valley because of the symbolism. He could do all the settlements. If he does all 130 settlements, it's gonna be very difficult to create separation between Israelis and Palestinians. The Trump peace plan creates contiguity, not geographically. It creates it sort of with tunnels, bridges, overpasses and the like. Uh, and physically separating Israelis from Palestinians in a situation where all 130 settlements are going to be absorbed is a problem if you really don't want the outcome to be one state for two people. So that you could see Bibi deciding not to do that as well because it really does tend to foreclose options down the road. And even if he might be inclined to do it, because the administration has said there has to be an agreement between you and Blue White uh, and I don't think that, that Gantz and Ashkenazi will accept all 130 settlements. You know, Bibi and the people around him are putting out that, well, if they, if they really try to, if they don't go along with what he wants, he'll go to elections. I don't think he wants to go to elections. If he wanted to go to elections, he could have already done it. Uh, you know, you, as I said, a million unemployed, uh, you still got to deal with all the implications and uh, consequences of COVID. I think he wants a national unity government uh, in these kinds of circumstances. And polls may look great today. If you have an election, say, four months from now, who knows? And he's too much of a master politician to necessarily look at the snapshot today and feel completely comfortable with it. So I think that you, you end up with what is a much smaller annexation if you do. And it could be, Sarah referred to Malay Adumim, which is, I could see Gush Etzion and Malay Adumim because these are areas that 95% of Israelis will say will be part of Israel and every peace proposal until today. When you were negotiating ambassador, were those always considered to be part of the Israel? Yes, absolutely. And the Palestinians accepted that too. The Palestinians, I wouldn't say they accepted it, but they began to talk about blocks. They've never, okay. we, one has to be careful about the, what the Palestinians, but I can say this. At one point they presented a, what they said was 1.8%. That included Gush Etzion, part of Israel. When we were at Camp David, not Arafat, but the negotiators accepted that Malay Adamim would be part of Israel. And on the peace plans, peace plans that we did, these two areas would have been part of Israel. So let's say for the, for the sake of argument that this is the scenario or the option that is adopted. If you really wanted to minimize the blowback uh, and the risks that you run, you could do several things. Bibi could do several things. You could frame it in the following way. You could say, number one, we're doing the minimum here. 
We're doing an area that every peace plan until today, prior to the Trump plan, would have made part of Israel and any eventual peace settlement. We're not doing this to preempt negotiations. We're doing this to signal that the Palestinians have to come to the table. They can't constantly never come to the table, never offer anything, never do a counter proposal, uh, and expect that somehow uh, they will get more in the future. No, they need to see that the realities on the ground begin to change and they need to see that. But let's also make it clear, we'll also make it clear, we're doing this because this allows us to preserve two states as an outcome, as a possibility. This allows us to preserve the possibility of separation. Uh, we believe in diplomacy, we wanna engage in negotiations. By the way, Menachem Begin extended Israeli law and administration to the Golan Heights in December of 1981, and three prime ministers, Rabin, Barak, and by the way, Bibi Netanyahu, all were prepared to negotiate the future uh, of the Golan Heights, including withdrawal from the Golan Heights. So as you say, there is a precedent for us in doing this and still making negotiations, still being committed to negotiations. They could do one more thing. They could, they could add a sweetener that again would make it easier. It would, I think it would make it easier on Palestinians, even if Palestinians and Abu Mazen are, have climbed up a tree, which Abu Mazen is very good at doing uh, and waits for someone to rescue him. Uh, but to the rest of the world, if, you, if they were to say what I just said, and they had the following, we're doing this, but we're also going to, we're going to take the a comparable percentage in what is Area C today, which is the area in the West Bank that Israel completely controls, has responsibility for security and all, um, uh, all planning and zoning and, and the like. And we're going to take, you know, a comparable percentage, and we're going to turn that into Area B, where the Palestinians have responsibility in a sense, a kind of domestic responsibility, planning and zoning, and for law and order. As a way of saying, okay, we're doing something for the Palestinians at the same time. This is not simply one thing where we're imposing, but we're sending a signal. We're open to negotiations on the one hand. We haven't done anything that really preempts it. Uh, we're sending a signal to the Palestinians that you do have to sit down and negotiate. We want the rest of the world to encourage them, but we're also doing something that expands the, the scope of what is Palestinian authority in the West Bank today. That, if you frame it that way, I think you could minimize the damage or you, you certainly would minimize the risk. So here's a question that combines, we have about 40 questions, so I'm trying to thematically, but one question is if Israel does proceed with annexing the full 30% or as, as they're talking about the maximalist, uh, the maximalist picture, does that basically end the opportunity for a two-state solution? And I'm throwing it both open to Dr. Hershon and Ambassador Ross and feel free to answer. I don't want to do it. Since I just spoke, uh, Dr. Hirshman, why don't you go ahead? You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Hopefully you'll, you'll compliment my remarks here. I think, um, you know, uh, it depends who you ask. Um, you know, Israel might be willing to say, well, what's so, what's so bad about a state on 70% of the West Bank? You can live with that. There are state, you know, there are micro states across the world. In any case, you're never going to have <clears throat> full territorial contiguity between Gaza and the West Bank. So some of these questions about contiguity, contiguity within the West Bank themselves are also sort of irrelevant. It's, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Do you want to stay on 70? Do you want to stay on 70% of the West Bank or do you want nothing? I think I could see Benjamin Netanyahu perhaps putting that, that, view, that view forward. I think the Palestinians have been very wedded to um, a understanding that Israel's, um, you know, maximal offer will never meet our, meet our minimal demands. That included when uh, Israel offered Palestinians to state on 92% of the West Bank with land swaps, but I think certainly in the question of a 70% of the West Bank is going to be a non-starter for the Palestinians. But I also think that there are deeply um, entrenched narratives that go back to the 1948 war and even perhaps um, beforehand that, um, you know, the vision of a Palestinian state historically for Palestinians, um, you know, perhaps with a small aberration during the 1990s um, of a two-state solution was a state between the river and the sea. And that's, I think, ideally what Palestinians would like. Then it has always become a question, and particularly in the 1990s when conditions were more favorable to um, some kind of uh, two-state solution, to discussing what kind of other outcome might be might be viable. But I do wonder whether that window has closed, and now um, a much more maximalist vision is, um, you know, has far more currency um, within the Palestinian movement today, particularly amongst younger Palestinians, um, than uh, than it did then. And I I don't think that 70% is going to be um, uh, possibility for many, if not most of them. 
but I think uh, Ambassador Ross can probably speak to this further because uh, he, he had much more direct, uh, direct uh, contact uh, in, in the 90s to speak to these issues. Uh, look, I would, just, I, would just, I would build on that point, the last point you made. Um, Palestinians look at the map, and by the way, Arabs who are, have grown very weary of the Palestinian conflict. Uh, most of the, the Sunni Arab leaders, they like this conflict to be over, and they don't have much faith in the Palestinians being able to settle it. And they're frustrated with them. But this is still a, a, a cause in the region. And by the way, they've spent 70 years socializing the cause, so it's not so easy for them to turn it off all of a sudden. Still having said that, when they looked at the Trump map, they said, who can stand up and say that looks like an independent state? It's surrounded by Israel. Uh, it's broken up into small enclaves. Uh, the irony is you could have, I suspected you could have, and I don't say this, I'm not saying this idly, I have some basis for saying it. You could have come in with a map that still preserved a lot, a lot for Israel. I would say more like even 12% that Arab states would have been prepared to come out and say, all right, it's a serious basis. This map didn't do that. And, and, to, pick, and to pick up on the last point you made, most Palestinians looking at this map say, look, okay, let's just have one state. All we want is a vote from the Israelis. Part of the appeal, by the way, of that is they're so fed up with their own leadership that they see it as completely corrupt, that they, they say, fine, you know, we'll, let's just have one state. I think the problem with the 70% is not even the percent, it's that the climate has become such that this looks so unattractive that in a sense, Palestinians say, if I'm given the choice of that or one state and I get a vote in Israel, I go one state in Israel. And by the way, if you poll young Palestinians, uh, this is the predominant sentiment. Uh, and it's, it's a complicated sentiment. It's not that they don't have an identity, but they have such little trust in their own leadership uh, that they, they opt for this. The irony, I think, for those on the right in Israel who think that, look, they prefer one state too, don't want to give the Palestinians any rights in that state. They think we can just give them autonomy and forget about them. And that unlikely is not going to, that's going to work. The, the, the great irony is the position of the PLO in the 1960s was one a binational secular democratic state. Of course, they had their own definition of democracy, but in a sense, that is a slogan that's going to come back. And if it looks like one state's the outcome, you're going to see a mantra from Palestinians, fine, one state, one person, one vote. And that's a disaster here. Really, that's a disaster here. So uh, now, if, if the Trump administration were to say, whatever the Israelis annex, we still view those borders as being negotiable. Yes, we established this. I can tell you, because I hear it from the Palestinians, the administration is passing the word to the Palestinians, if you'll just engage with us, there'll be no annexation. But the clock is ticking, and we won't, you know, we're not going to hold the Israelis back forever. That's why I say there's a, for, I think for, for Jared Kushner, this is a lever, it's not an end in itself. Uh, and there are efforts being made right now. The Palestinians won't. I, I said, Abu Mazen has a PhD, but I've always said his PhD is in tree climbing without a ladder. Uh, and he right now is sort of trapped himself. Uh, I do believe that what we're seeing from some of the Arabs suggests to me that they are still themselves thinking about what might be done. Uh, and I wouldn't say this is all a done deal yet. I do think if nothing changes, we're going to end up with a minimal annexation, uh, and a lot will the reaction and the consequence will very heavily depend on the framing of it. Combining two questions: If mainstream, uh, will the opposition of annexation by American Jewish organizations or the opinions of mainstream uh, or the opinions of various analysts, from Daniel Pipes on the right uh, to your colleague David Makovsky in the middle? to those on the left play any role in dissuading the Israeli government from moving forward? My answer right now would be, I see very little prospect of it. They, I think they, there is some influence on Blue White, on Gantz and Ashkenazi. Uh, I think it's had some effect, uh, but I don't think it's had an effect on, on Bibi. Bibi at this point, 
still reads us a certain way. Uh, and, you know, I, I do find it interesting because I said, if you look at his history, he's always been very careful and risk averse when it comes to national security issues. So, look, if Shin Bet comes in, and I think they will, and they go through uh, what are their genuine concerns, and they, they tell truth to power, they won't hold back. If the IDF comes in and says, look, we're looking at these scenarios and we think we're going to have to mobilize reserves, then I then you could definitely see BB change his position. But but he's so he too has climbed a tree. It's not going to be easy for him to climb down from the tree he's on. He probably needs a cover, an explanation. You know, I mean, look, if if uh, if the Arab, if a number of Arab leaders said to the administration, we'll be prepared to sit with Bibi and have you host us, not including the Palestinians, with no annexation, I think Bibi would leap at that. Uh, I just don't think that that's where they are. That's where the Arabs are, where the leaders are. Uh, but I think that I'm suggesting there could be ways out, that something will have to change. And it isn't the arguments coming from people here that at this point looks to me to be decisive. Dr. Hershon, have anything to add to that? Look, I think more generally, perhaps not speaking to the annexation issue specifically, but in Bibi's more, um, you know, general attitude towards American Jewry is I really think that he's, especially liberal American Jewry, I think that, you know, for, to some extent he's written them off. We can look to the controversy over the Western Wall, the Kotel, and the egalitarian prayer space. And you can see very clearly that I think Netanyahu has made the calculation that in 50 years, um, American Jewry is going to be mostly Haredi for what exists at all. This is where the demographic trends are leaning. And that placating liberal American Jews today really doesn't buy him anything tomorrow. So um, I'm sorry to say that I think our impact is limited now. I think perhaps some of Ambassador Ross's colleagues in particular carry a lot of weight with Netanyahu, but I think the um, you know, the broad, um, you know, the broad consensus of American Jewry on any particular issue is not necessarily Netanyahu's calculation. I think it's also, it goes beyond Netanyahu that there is a very large divide between American Jews and average Israelis on this issue. The average Israeli votes for Lilikud or blue and white, which is essentially the same policy positions as Lilikud, but without the personal corruption of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, a majority, something like 58% are pro-annexation. Um, maybe more with American approval. So there's just a huge gulf between our two communities on this issue, um, and that um, will be difficult to overcome. What factors have led to the virtual collapse of the Israeli center left, and what impact did the rejection, and how extensive was the rejection of Palestinian, um, let me try this again, what, what factors led to the collapse of the Israeli center left, and how much um, did Palestinian rejection of previous, of previous peace proposals play in that, uh, in the fact that the left parties have shrunk from being the majority in the days up until Begin and are now minuscule Labor is what, five, six seats or, or whatever. I invite either one of you to respond. Why don't I start? Um, look, I think to, it's, it's not so much the collapse of the center. The center is always still there. Blue and white does represent a lot of the center. Uh, the left has collapsed, and it's collapsed because the peace camp collapsed, because it wasn't even the rejection of the Clinton parameters, it was the second intifada. That completely discredited the peace camp in Israel. Uh, and, and then the Sharon decision to withdraw unilaterally from Gaza, you know, so Israel withdrew from Lebanon and withdrew from Gaza, and what did it get? Didn't get security, didn't get peace, it got rockets and violence. So you get an intifada when you have the most forthcoming government in Israel's history offering things at the table. Uh, and you get a perception of the Palestinians that, uh, that they, will, they simply will never accept uh, Israel as a state of the Jewish people, the nation state of the Jewish people. I mean, unfortunately, as someone who works on these issues and remains committed to it, you have a mirror image on the Palestinian side. Both sides completely are convinced that the other will never accept what is a, a baseline needs. Do you believe that? No, I actually think it's possible to change, but I do think our problem right now is profound disbelief on both sides. And the wrong place to start when you're dealing with profound disbelief is some kind of big plan. You have no possibility of bridging the gulfs right now, psychologically or substantively. And when you launch a big plan and it fails, all you do is deepen the disbelief. So you have to start at a very different level. You have to start with 
much smaller steps where you can begin to create a sense again that there's a possibility. There is none of that today. Think about the following. 2015 and then three elections last 2019, 2020. The opposition candidate did not make peace an issue. Is it because they don't make they don't believe in peace? No, because they don't want to look like a friar, meaning they don't want to look like a sucker. Uh, so you have no belief in it today in Israel. You certainly don't have it on the Palestinian side. You have to, one of the reasons you, you need diplomacy that, that is focused on how do you begin to recreate some sense of possibility, uh, you need to do that because otherwise we're going to end up with one state. Uh, and the irony, as I said before, so those who are big believers of the PLO approach, they're going to end up being, they'll be the, they'll be the victors in this. Uh, but anyway, that's the reason you've seen it's fundamentally it was it was the second intifada more than anything else that fundamentally changed the character of the of the political psychology on this issue. Dr. Hirsch, on you have anything to add to that? Um, not too much. The only thing I would say is in recent years is that Benjamin Netanyahu is, himself has, you know, um, run a rather relentless campaign demonizing the left and everyone, um, you know, who does not agree with his policies has been labeled an enemy of the people. Um, and that, um, you know, has only accelerated the structural trends that Ambassador Ross has laid out. So there's a whole bunch of questions, but we soon have to cut off this call. So I want to try and get uh, just put like five questions into one. Basically, about five questions ask if Israel, what, how is American foreign policy towards Israel going to change if Biden is elected president? Mm -hmm. Want to start off, Dr. Hershon, or Ambassador? Uh, no, I'll let Ambassador Ross, because maybe I'll speak more to where I think millennials are on this issue. Um, so let me say um, look, there's a, there, there's a general fatigue with America, with American overreach. Uh, you saw it in the Obama administration. There's an impulse towards retrenchment. Obviously, with with Trump, with America First, which is frequently America alone, uh, he wants to end the endless wars. He doesn't want to be there. Uh, I do think that that Biden is much more of an internationalist than Trump is. Trump isn't an internationalist at all. They'll be. They've remarked he's an isolationist, actually. Well, he'll. They. Uh, Biden would would try to restore. The alliance system. He would try to play an American role. He is in, he's an instinctive friend of Israel, fundamentally. That's just who he is. Uh, and um, but I think he would he too will have to struggle to maintain an American presence in the region. You know, if there's a second Trump term, we'll be out of the region. Trump doesn't want to be there. You know, uh, and. Uh, and that's not in Israel's interest, by the way. Israel needs American presence in the Middle East. Uh, if, if we're not there, Israel is much more at the mercy of those players who are going to fill the vacuum that the U.S. leaves. And we've seen the Russians try to do it. You're going to see China become more involved. Uh, and Israel right now is caught between the United States and China. Uh, and you're going to see, you know, the Iranians are going to continue to try to do this, uh, to fill in the vacuum. So I do think there'll be more of an effort to to try to somehow create an American presence that is more sustainable in the region. There'll be more of an effort on diplomacy writ large uh, in the region. Uh, but I wouldn't, you know, with, with all the, the differences, there'll be a difference in tone, uh, but there'll be a difference in substance as well. There'll be an effort to sort of establish ground rules. Okay, the do's and don'ts of what we'll do in the region, the do's and don'ts of, with our friends. Uh, I think that's what you'll see that's different because now, no, no, what, what is our real purpose in the region today? I mean, I follow these things pretty closely and I'm not sure I could easily explain it. We have a maximum pressure policy on Iran, which is really maximum economic pressure. Uh, it's really not more than that. Um, you know, the Iranians today have cut their breakout time from one year to about four months. This is an issue. I mean, this is Bibi's issue has always been this, but we don't hear anything about it right now. Uh, and this issue is going to come back to the fore. Which is interesting because that's what the prime minister has been speaking almost about nonstop for 15 years, the threat of Iran. That's right. You know? well, because he likes the pressure on Iran, but we have to admit the fact that in the nuclear area, they're now much closer to a breakout time than they were uh, when Trump came in. Uh, in, the, in the region, Israel has carried out about 1,300 
strikes, hit 1,300 targets in Syria, and they're paying for that. By the way, none of that was programmed into the Obama MOU, 10 years of assistance. Trump administration hasn't given Israel one more penny. Right? But Israel is carrying out what are very costly kinds of operations because they're the ones blunting what the Iranians are doing with a precision guided project to put what is the equivalent of kind of a GPS on all the rockets that is dumb bombs. So I think these are issues that the next administration, whoever it is, are going to have to take on uh, because they haven't been dealt with at this point. We have time for one more. Let. I don't. I'm going to have to go. Okay. Uh, then I will thank you, Ambassador. I'm going to just pose one more question to Dr. Hershon. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as always, it's, a, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to host you, and thank you for your insights. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One, nice last, you. one last question, uh, Dr. Hershon, is, um, is I'm summarizing several uh, uh, questions here, is that do the Palestinians ever pay a price for rejectionism? In other words, a lot of people, several, about five questions have here. The Palestinian world, the Arab world, it's, to say that the Arab world doesn't accept uh, a compromise is, is, is not true. Israel has obviously peace treaties with Jordan and Egypt, but, but the basic question, of, a basic thrust of a lot of these questions is the Palestinians never seem to miss an opportunity, as Abba even said, to miss an opportunity. And they keep, and they are allowed to uh, and they're relying on world pressure to advance their position. So, why, so several of these questions say, why shouldn't the Israelis go forward with their annexation as a mean of pressuring, um, as a measure, as a mean of pressuring Palestinians to perhaps actually come to the table to engage in bilateral negotiations? And that's our final question. Okay. Um, I just want to, if it's okay, I just also just wanted to add a word to the question about um, U.S. foreign policy, which is to say that, you know, I live on planet academia land, and I work primarily with millennials, um, so I'm seeing, um, you know, the trends that are happening in the uh, left wing of the Democratic Party very up close and personal on a, on a daily basis, and I am concerned about um, what annexation and some of these other, um, the Trump administration's larger policies will mean for um, the rise of, of those views. Um, as opposed to more centrist, moderate democratic views that um, a can candidate Biden perhaps represents, um, because they are very, very strong um, in the world that I live, and it seems that they are becoming increasingly strong in organized uh, American political parties as well. Um, that has implications for US policy. It also has implications for American Jews. I wonder if eventually we will find ourselves somewhat politically homeless if these trends continue to accelerate. Um, when it comes to the issue of the Palestinians, look, do they pay a price? Of course they paid a price. Since 1948, um, one state emerged in this reason, and that state was the state of Israel. The state of Palestine has never existed. The Palestinians have lived under an occupation, not only Israelis, but um, they have lived under an occupation for their entire existence as a people in a modern sense of the word. First the Ottomans, then the British, then the Jordanians or the Egyptians between 1948 and 1967, and finally the Israelis. They've never known sovereignty of their own. So have they paid a price? They've paid, and they've paid an extremely high price. They've also paid a price in terms of um, a refugee population that has lived mostly without citizenship rights um, in various states, state, um, states of the region, except for Jordan, which granted Palestinian citizenship um, after the 1948 war. Um, and further today, um, particularly Gazans are facing a tremendous humanitarian crisis. Um, and that really doesn't get the world's attention on a regular basis until the rockets start flying again. Um, and that's a dynamic I think that um, is very, very sad to behold that here are um, a people who are, you know, um, who are um, suffering um, from, you know, four hours of electricity in the middle of August in the Middle East, um, poor sanitation, lack of water, um, very few jobs for a younger generation, which of course makes them more politically active and politically militant, um, a dysfunctional political system, a, um, a government, particularly in Gaza, that uses its own people as a human shield against Israel. Um, there, are, there are many reasons that the, the Palestinian people have suffered for some of their decisions. Um, but there is also, um, I, I think, a sense that Palestinians had been offered various scenarios. And I think, um, you know, the, the thinking, Israel's thinking is, is, I think, generally has been up until recently in the annexation debate is that, um, you know, if, uh, if, if they hold on, 
um, nothing will change. And I think things are changing on the ground and that um, for both Israelis and for Palestinians and um, there's going, you know, this is going to have to be um, attended to. Now, the question of whether annexation, however, um, is a good way of bringing the Palestinians to the table, I think should be decoupled from the question of whether Palestinians have, a, have paid a price. I'm not sure that this is the best way to bring Palestinians back to the table. In fact, I think this might be one of the worst ways to bring Palestinians back to the table. So in a sense that, um, you know, they will, they will also continue to pay a price for not participating in this, but I think that there, um, there, there are reasons that this isn't the most fruitful, fruitful method for, um, for, um, trying to reach a kind of bilateral agreement. Um, but I think we should be concerned um, that um, I, I don't see it actually as a downside. I see it as an upside. The Palestinians um, are reliant on uh, public opinion, in fact, to advance their cause because um, rather than some of what they might have been offered at the negotiation table where they don't have as much power, in fact, they have a much more power in the public sphere um, than they do um, in bilateral negotiations. So in fact, I see that not as a price that they've paid, but in fact, as a dividend of um, some of their public relations success. Thank you, Dr. Hershon. And I think we will conclude here. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hershon. I've already thanked uh, Ambassador Ross for uh, for what was an outstanding analysis. It was wonderful having you with us here today. Um, there was over 400 people on this call, and um, I hope you enjoyed, uh, to everybody out there, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. There are many more uh, webinars coming up by the JCRC on topics of Jewish interest, um, and you can have confidence that your JCRC will continue to effectively advocate for our Jewish community now and in the future. And to everyone, be well and stay healthy. And again, thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon. Thank Goodbye. Take me. care. It's our honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Stay well, everyone.